And thank you again for tuning in. Uh, my name is Julie Busby. I'm the founder of Busby Group. We are a residential real estate team in Chicago. We are fortunate enough to be in the top 1% uh, of Chicago brokers. And uh, we were uh, very proud last year. We sold the top four sale in Chicago. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this 23 plus years, a commentator for CNN and uh, speaking of, I know we were just chatting about that. So, uh, I've learned a few things along the way, and that's what started this casual conversations. I bring in two of my favorite experts to share what we've seen in the last year, what we expect for this next year, give some tips, advice, and, and keep it fun. So with me tonight, we have Mike Flamis. We love lovingly call him Mike V. Uh, he is with Annan Mortgage. <laughs> I love it. Uh, they have been around for 25 years uh, and they lend in 22 states and he is one of our team's go-to lender. He's helped uh, team members, myself. Uh, he is one of the sweetest guys out there. So thank you for joining us, Mike. Um, and then we have Marcy Blanco. Marcy and I have worked together for over a decade. Uh, she's, she founded um, MAM Collective Design. She is an interior designer working with developers, uh, remodels, um, individual owners just to do a room, consults. Um, and she has a very exciting project coming up in Michigan, which will be a wellness center. So it's all very exciting. Uh, and Marcy, thank you for joining us as well. So I will dive in. Um, we figured we'd start off by just sharing what we saw last year and then what we expect for this next year. So I am going to share my screen to share some data. Uh, here we go. Okay, so we are on my the Busby Group website. This is what I love about our website is that we have active data on our website at any time. This is like a member of a secret club because this is real time data that you can collect at any time. So I am in Chicagoland right now, but we do have it for each uh, neighborhood. So reach out to us afterwards and we can even get it to you for different suburb neighborhoods uh, and all the 77 neighborhoods in the city. So the first up is inventory. We have the graph going from 2020 to today. Why do we do 2020? Because that was right before COVID and COVID has certainly changed the marketplace. So we like to show um, those three years to show what have we seen um, since COVID came about. So you see, this is inventory. And this last year, we had lower inventory than we've had in the previous years. I have my data here. We are down 24% um, in inventory this last year. So, uh, you know, what do I expect for that this next year? Inventory is going to go up, which is a great thing um, because we've been needing it. Uh, Sellers have been on the fence to sell because rates were going up last year, but we have pent up sellers need to sell. So we do anticipate an increase in inventory this next year. So that is good news for buyers. Average market time. You will see that um, market time obviously went for especially single went down over the uh, since COVID, but we started to go back up this year. Why did that happen? Well, um, rates, quite honestly. You see that they started to go up at the end of the year. That's right when rates were starting to get higher um, and it did take longer to sell in Chicago. You'll see by the end of the year, the average market time is about 70 days. I like to point out pre-COVID, when we kind of say it was a neutralized marketplace, we were around 80-ish days as average market time. So while it went up this last year, uh, it's not what it was even pre-COVID. Um, but the rates and seasonality in general, at the end of the year, we tend to have um, market time go up because it's Q4, people are slowing down, and then the rates going up too, it just kind of was a double whammy and it did slow down our market time. What do we expect for this next year? We do expect it to go um, to normalize, or I guess uh, be a shorter market time. Um, and that's because with, again, rates, rates are a driving factor. And we'll let Mike get into that, but with rates coming down, we do think market time will come down. Um, so, and it also depends though, because as we get closer to election time, uh, you know, I think we'll, the market will slow down significantly as we get closer to the election. 
average sales price. So I like to show from 2020, the beginning of 2020 to today. Look at that. We have had a regular increase in value. And despite last year being a bit slower, um, we did still see an increase in value. I have the number here. Um, increase in value went up overall in Chicagoland 3%. And you know what? That's what we normally say is what it is for a normal market. Year over year is 3%. The years prior during COVID, they've gone up significantly more, but that was because of that those very low rates. Um, in fact, from 2020 to um, the end of the year last year, uh, Condos went up 21.5% in um, appreciation, and single-family homes went up 31.5% over those three years. But we normally, again, see about a 3% appreciation, so it's great that last year we had about a 3% um, year-over-year appreciation. And this coming year, we're expecting single-digits appreciation again, probably 3 to 5%, probably a little more. We even anticipate that um, last year sales in general went down and nationwide we were down here i'll stop sharing this nationwide we went down about uh 21 percent in sales and uh this year we're expected to go up about 14 percent in sales so and again we tend we would we're, we'll likely see an increase in um your your price as well between three and five percent so there you have it. Uh, my recap of 2023 and what we expect for 2024. Uh, rates obviously were a big, uh, a big indicator in the marketplace. So, Mike, I will let you chat about what we saw last year and what we expect for this next year. Thank you, Julie. Some of that yes. stuff was even interesting to me. Um, I didn't know some of those percentages. Um, so, we all know 2023 was a difficult year for the housing market. It started out with the negative trends that, that carried over from 2022, and it turned into the least affordable year for home buying on record. It's a pretty mm. bold statement. Um, we saw high mortgage rates. We saw high inflation. We saw high housing and rental prices. Interest rates began the year about 6.5%. They peaked around 8% in the fall and finished the year right where they started at 6.5%. So combined with increasing home prices, um, many prospective home buyers were, were deterred from applying for a mortgage. So our industry got slammed, the mortgage industry. Um, inflation remained stubbornly high, uh, even though it eventually fell. Uh, the price of goods and services rose 6.6%, just below the previous year's high. And that's the second highest inflation level since 1982. Wow. So, yeah, that's a long time. Uh, and then inflation then fell steadily throughout the year, but was still above healthy levels. Um, the spring home buying season never happened. Usually we sit around here and anticipate the spring home buying season to explode. Well, back when the rates were 3% or less, it exploded in January <laughs> in February, but right. it never really happened. Um, inventory was uh, historically low, like Julie mentioned. Um, sales plummeted. Home buyers didn't want to pay uh, twice as much for a home that they would have paid three or four years ago, and they didn't want to give up their pre-pandemic rates. A lot of people have low rates. Home prices rose to record uh, highs. The U.S. median uh, sale price for a home was four hundred twenty-five thousand um, in June, just right below the previous year's record high. Rent prices remained high, but mm -hmm. stopped short of the record. Um, the U.S. median rent price was just over $2,000 in August, and it matched the number from the previous year. New listings dropped to their no lowest level on record. There was just 5.4 million new listings in 2023, the lowest level recorded ever, and a massive 16% drop from 2022. These are huge statistics, percentages, and numbers. Um, one third of homes were purchased with cash. How do you like that statistic? Um, up 30, wow, one third, one third were bought with cash and that was up 30% over 2022. That's the wow. highest percentage in a decade. Luxury homes experienced the largest decline on record. Um, bidding wars fell, investor purchases dropped. It was, a, it was a war zone. Now let's talk about better news. Let's predict something. <laughs> yes, please. 
Yeah, that's before the, I start drinking. <laughs> depressing. So 2024 is expected to be a much better year where home buyers will finally catch a break with home prices, with new listings, with better interest rates. Home prices, they might not rise as fast in the short term, like Julie mentioned, 3%, maybe to 5 But right. by the end of the year, we see it and hopefully going up because that's when the rates are going to really go down in the third quarter. Um, new listings will pick up. Um, many online searches show a double-digit interest um, in people wanting to um, accept the fact that they won't see 3% rates anymore. So they're starting to sell their homes before there's some crash, which there's one every 10, 20 years. You know? um, even though the risk real estate's consistently appreciating, there's certain areas around the country that experienced exponential increases, like Florida, San Francisco. So th th those are unique situations. They, they alter the statistics that we all see. Um, mortgage rates continue to decline. After four Fed increases in 2023 and seven Fed increases in 2022, it is expected this year there will be anywhere from two to six decreases. So by the Fed's not raising the federal fund rate, mortgage rates will continue to decline. Many experts say they will re remain in the low to low 6% to 6.5% range. Some experts suggest they will go below 6% in the third quarter, maybe to 5.75. Um, one more statistic about renting. Um, renting is still holding on because the largest population in America is millennials. And statistically, one out of five millennials believe they'll never own their own home. Um, another 12% say they're ju just not interested. 7% say don't, they don't want to have to maintain the property. Um, uh, many millennials are stating they would rather invest their money than fork up the down payment and closing costs. I can give you many, many examples of young people I talked to years ago who are really sad they didn't buy when the rates were at 3%. And now the prices are much higher and the rates are much higher. So with everything I said, I want to tell you something that I call the cost of waiting can be very expensive. So let's say you want to buy a $700,000 home at a 7% interest rate. And let's say it goes up over the next few years, approximately 5% per year. Um, if you wait two years, you're going to need an additional $14,000 for that down payment. That monthly payment will be almost $400 more a month if the rate stayed the same. Now, if the rate went down, you, you, would, you would have a, a payment that's $23 less than what it is now, but you would lose approximately $72,000 of appreciation. That home is going to appreciate over two years. So you've got to pay more for your down payment, more for your taxes, more for your insurance, more for your HOA if it's a condominium, and you lost out on $72,000 in, in um, appreciation. So if you're coming to me or Julie and you're thinking about buying and you ask us when's the time to buy, it sounds like you're ready to buy. Um, look, get a good lender, get a good real estate agent like Mike and Julie. Um, buy whatever the rate is. My first home was 12%. Right. I refinanced that 9 I was so happy I bought a second condo in the building. I had two condos at 9% on Lakeshore Drive. Right. So because in a year or two or three, the appreciation is going to put money in your pocket eventually, and you're going to refinance anyway. So the cost of waiting can be very expensive. Well, and I want to point out, too, last year the rates did get higher. We all agree, and, and the market was, was tough, as we, we said. But when you look at statistically over the last 30 years, the um, average rate was 7.74. That's correct. So That's we are, it, it really didn't get, like you mentioned, double digits. So 7.74 is the average in the last 30 years. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't that high. It's just that we've been very spoiled with low rates prior right. to that. Um, so now we're in the sixes, right? Mike, we're around, where are we right now? So it's, it's, it's funny. This was a bad week. Somebody at the Fed uh -oh. said something. Yeah. The, the, so the rates were, were, were creeping down to six and a half. I even did right. some deals for certain borrowers at 6.25. The, 
This week, somebody at the Fed put their foot in their mouth. Some inflation statistics came out and the rates went up this week. So instead of instead of six and a quarter to six and a half, we were at six and a half to six point nine. I think okay. it's just a, it's just a blurb and they're still going to come down um, holding around the six and a half to high six percent range until they start to go down in that third quarter. Well, and then again, like in general, we're still in the sixes, which is lower than the average in the last 30 years. My saying for 2024 is don't try to time the market. When you try to time the market, you will miss the market. So inventory is going to come up. You'll probably find something that you like in these spring months is when inventory usually picks up and rates are in the sixes. You know, it, it, that is still a great rate. Um, I got it when we were starting to get up into eight last year. I got that again, because I was higher than the, what I'm, you know, the average I've seen in the 23 years I've been doing this. Um, but uh, don't don't try to time the market. When you time the market, you might miss the market. And if you freak out when I say I paid 12 percent, just remember the highest rates ever were 18 percent. Right. It was the all time high. And the low right. was about 2.75. We're talking 30 right. year fixed. Right. All right. Everyone's heads are probably spinning. <laughs> so many statistics. The, uh, the creative Marcy is like, when do we get to the fun stuff? <laughs> um, but so I always love having Marcy uh, level us out because we'll, we'll just talk statistics and splurt out data all day long. Um, but now we have Marcy to talk about what the trends were in 2023 uh, for design and what we expect for 2024. So I am going to share my screen. I am going to give a disclosure that it um, it, it takes a minute. So I have to take and then anyways, I'm going to do it. And then um, and then it just takes a minute So just bear with us as we do this. All right. Let me get this up. Go to full screen. There, this should come up. Just thinking, it's fine. All right, there we go, Marcy. All right, so 2023 was not my favorite year for design trends, um, much like not Mike or Julie's favorite um, in their respective roles either. Um, I have heard the term samiest used a couple of times with regards to design trends in 2023 and even in 2022 um that everybody just kind of got over influenced by pinterest and um instagram and you know these homes these are six different homes none of these spaces exist in the same um place from completely different areas of the country different you know, single family homes, townhouses, condos, and they all look the same. Now, I will tell you, one of these images is a design that I did. So <laughs> I'm not totally against this particular aesthetic. And it's what a lot of people love. And there's definitely some, you know, benefits and some, you know, wonderful things about this aesthetic. The, the trend was light woods and light cabinets and light and airy and you could, you know, again, kind of mix and match from rooms across the country and it would all go together because it was just, again, the samiest design trend um, that I've seen in a long time. Everything kind of became really monotonous, um, very neutral and very light. Um, so I'm not going to talk about this the past year very much, Julie, if you would like to go ahead and switch. Um, the upcoming trends are going back to really being founded and grounded in timeless design and designing for your own home, your specific context, your specific family, the way you live your life, um, pieces that you take time to find and curate things that really make sense and speak to you, you know, letting your, your personality and your, you know, particular voice kind of shine through and, you know, removing some of the noise of influencing from social media and what everyone else is doing. Um, the trend is toward color, um, 
towards, again, vintage finds and unique pieces um, toward darker and moodier finishes. So, you know, a nice walnut finish is definitely coming back um, in cabinetry and, um, you know, in case pieces and darker tiles. And again, color, color, color is coming back. Um, and I will say that top right bedroom, that the actual room itself, there are gray walls and cream carpet. There is nothing necessarily interesting about the space that all of those pieces are occupying, but the person that designed it, designed it very intentionally. And that's a really interesting room and a really interesting space. And you can kind of get a sense of what that person is like and what kind of family lives in that space. And those are the types of spaces that we're seeing that designers, you know, myself and other designers that I talk to um, are really getting excited about. And I think people are ultimately a lot happier dwelling in a space that really speaks of them and to them and doesn't look like, you know, Katie from New Hampshire could come in and live in their house too. And it could look the exact same way. Um, and I will say this, this is kind of a hill that I've been dying on lately. And I, I'm a super organized person. All of my stuff is in bins, but the super organ organization <laughs> trend has almost gone a little too far. I saw a video the other day of someone decanting their orange juice and milk and you don't need to do that. So my kind of mantra going forward, you know, Julie's was don't try to time the market or you'll miss the market. Mine is don't be over influenced. Sometimes you have to just kind of, you know, put on horse blinders, drown out the noise and really um, wait for something that feels like it is uniquely yours. And, um, and you can do that with pieces like that bedroom. Um, you know, Julie and I talk about resale. What's, what's the balance between personalization and not, um, alienating potential buyers when you start thinking about resale and that bedroom is a perfect example. All of that stuff you take with you and a buyer doesn't come in and look and think, oh gosh, I've got to change everything. Um, and paint, paint is just paint. You know, if you paint everything classic gray on your way out the door, you know, that beautiful mudroom that's on the bottom um, in the middle, it's it's a coat of paint and a day. And it's, you know, back to something that is more universally appealing and the next person can come in and put their personal spin on it. Um, so, yeah, 2024 is color. It's dark and moody. It's timeless design. It's curated pieces. It's you know, um, a little bit of a return to the classics, the wood case pieces and things that you would have seen in a home in, you know, maybe 1900, um, something that feels like it's been there for a while and can stand the test of time. I am just going to chime in. I love this dark at the bottom as the chair rail. I always call it a chair rail. I know it's mm -hmm. not, but uh, I love that. That bathroom is stunningly gorgeous and could be in a Gilded Age mansion. It could right. be in a brand new condo in the Gold Coast. Right. Um, you know, it, but it's, it's timeless and it, you know, you can tell that the person that's getting ready there is cool and chic and well-educated, you know, like it just, it speaks to the personality of the person exactly. that in that space. Absolutely. I, I think we're all, the neutral was nice. It's calming, but you're right. It's just it, uh, it. The white on the white on the white was getting a little old. And the well, and I do green. think you know I have bachelor's in psychology, master's in interior design. So sometimes they you know come together. I think a little bit of that was a response, and the over organization I think was a little right. bit of a response to our PTSD from COVID. Yeah, you know everything felt so frazzled and so out of control. We needed to like just. It needed to be neutral and quiet. Good point. And, you know, it was just kind of our overcorrecting from the drama and the chaos that happened. That's very, very valid point and, and makes sense. All right. I will stop sharing that. It just takes a minute. Well, thank you. Let's see here. Are we still, can you guys, there we go. All right, I'm back. <laughs> the sharing is a little difficult sometimes. Um, okay, so 
Marcy, what else do you see for potential sellers in regards to if they do want that statement piece? I know you said you could do, um, you know, a, a, a piece that you could easily take with you and then paint. Anything else that they want to do a statement piece to be safe as we're well, you broke up a little bit there, but I think I got the whole question. Um, yeah, I mean, pieces that you can take with you um, and infusing the color there. Um, also, if there's a trend that you love, don't invest too much in the trend. Like, don't buy a whole set of dining room chairs that have caning or whatever the trend is that you are wanting to implement in your home. Do smaller things like baskets or a vase or something that, you know, it, it's just not a huge investment and you can swap out and won't be heartbroken if, um, you know, mm. if the trend goes by the wayside. Um, but I talk about this all the time. Wallpapers are a great way to personalize a space and really dramatically change a space. And the wallpapers these days are really easy off. I mean, it's like it peels off in sheets. It's not the, you know, headache and heartache that it used to be. And there are a lot of wallpapers, a lot of companies that you can do it yourself reasonably, not peel and stick. Um, Julie, you've heard me mention this company a million times. It's Milton and King. They do paste the wall wallpaper where you literally just do a roller on the wall and stick up dry wallpaper. It's the easiest self-application. Um, and then it comes right down. You wipe down your walls and it's good to go. It's ready for a seller in the seller's point of view. Um, and those are really easy things um, when you're looking to sell, if you're trying to get your home ready. Perfect. Well, thank you. Uh, so I opened up the chat. So everyone who is in attendance, feel free to ask Marcy, myself, or my question. Um, and in the meantime, we can uh, sit and chat and ask each other questions as well. So Mike, I wanted to know, um, what do you, I mean, you and I have talked about this, but I think it'd be good for everyone to hear. How do you feel about the election and how that will impact rates? So it's a great question because everyone in their mind probably thinks the same thing about an election. But now I'll tell you what the data and my research can, can, can expose. Um, first, you got to remember, feds have nothing to do with the mortgage rate. The Federal Reserve sets a target rate for the federal funds rate, which is the overnight banking between banks. And there's other factors like inflation, uh, the price of treasuries, uh, and the housing market. So the biggest rate decrease after an election happened in 2008, and it was eight tenths of a percent. Prior to that, the next biggest rate decrease was a half a percent in 1980. So historically, from all elections from 1972, every four years to present, the rate decrease after an election was only one-tenth to a half a percent. So people think the rates are going to plummet after the election. It's a fallacy. Um Subconsciously, we all think there's going to be a big reduction. So over the last almost 50 years, only four times was that decrease more than 0.4. Only four times was it 0.4 to, to a half a percent. Wow. So the historical data suggests that the election does not have a significant change in interest rates. It's just minimal. Wow. So, Very I mean, again... Like, don't try to time the market. If you try to time the market, you'll miss the market. And as inventory is coming up this year, this is the time because rates are still below the average. So that's, that's, I, you told me that statistic earlier this week when we were chatting about a client and I was surprised. I even thought after election, we might see a, a decrease, but it, it, they tend to go up. That's really interesting. Um, okay. Uh, Marcy, someone's asking the name of the wallpaper brand again, and I think it's Milton and something. Milton, M-I-L-T-O-N, and King. Awesome. They've got great wallpapers, and I am very impatient. Um, when I do something myself, there's always a lot of frustration and a lot of cuss words. Um, <laughs> and I have hung this wallpaper 
multiple, multiple times. I've done it for projects. I've done it for myself. I did it for our investment property in Michigan that has not flat walls. Um, and it's totally doable. It, it really is. It's helpful to have another person, but you can also do it yourself if you don't have too high ceilings. Um, so I go to them all the time because I know I won't have to pay for an installer, which is huge. Amazing. Um, we are asked the average uh, HOA in Chicago, which is the Homeowners Association um, assessments, uh, or the Homeowner Organization assessment amount. I don't have that number. I've actually never been asked that question in 23 years. So let me pull that for you. I will uh, make sure I get your email address and send that to you so you know what the average is. Obviously, I will give you some data. When you have staff, like uh, you know, an engineer or uh, a door person, that's when your assessments go up and when you have an elevator. So it tends to be, obviously, if you're in the loop, River North, Gold Coast, Streeterville, you're going to have higher assessments because they're heavily staffed and have elevators and a lot of amenities. So that's going to drive up your assessments. These smaller boutique buildings will have much lower assessments, but I do not have an average for all of Chicago, um, but let us work on that data for you and we'll get that to you. Uh, good question. Uh, we also have a question. Do you have any neighborhood trends that we've seen or are seeing? Um, good question. So. I will say the burbs are still hot. Um, you know, the, the, the pendulum always swings. And for a while, it was so city heavy that the burbs were not cool at all. And the burbs have been having their moment and they're still having their moment. But that said, city people are city people and they are still are interested in the city. Um, so Marcy smiles, <laughs> yes. So, you know, it is, what I love because the, the burbs are popular and the city is still popular too. So that's great. Now within the city, I will tell you, um, you know, single family homes, you saw we have seen a 31.5% appreciation in the last few years in single family homes. Maybe you're priced out of Bucktown, Lincoln Park, um, Lakeview. A few neighborhoods to keep in mind are Old Irving Park. Love it. It is so charming. Developers are going there. Uh, Marcy and I have a friend developer who's done a lot of projects up there. Uh, a great area to consider. And also a few of our team members live here and I've even opened my eyes further to it. Saganosh and, um, and Edgebrook. Two great areas to keep in mind. Um, if you're looking for a starter home, you can get a lot of great land and a great home in those areas as well. If the city has, you know, for single family home gotten a little high for you. Something else on Gold Coast. Poor Gold Coast has had a rough two years. Um, it has just been kind of brutal on Gold Coast. And it's not fair because I love Gold Coast. But um it just has, that, that's one area that's definitely um, seen a decrease in value. That said, um, we are seeing a rejuvenated interest in, in Gold Coast. Uh, we are finding the, the larger homes, the larger square footage. Um, what we're finding is buyers are who, who are looking in Gold Coast might be looking more, um, maybe they're, they're selling their home in the suburbs, wanting to move downtown, but they don't need as much space. This won't be their full-time residents or their only residents. Maybe they're also buying in Florida or Arizona. So we are seeing um, a little pickup in Gold Coast, but it's more of the two, three beds um, and some of the larger ones. As Mike, you said the data on luxury. Luxury took a, a toll last year um, and Gold Coast was not a stranger to that last year. That said, we sold the highest sale in Gold Coast last year. <laughs> so it can still be done if you're working with a good professional. Um, Okay, let's see here. We have so many great questions. Uh, um, hold on. I'm trying to scroll through to see if we have any more. Mike, if I shop around for rates, what makes them different from lender to lender? Great question. So most of the rates we quote are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac backed government insured loans the safest the lowest there's no prepayment penalty when you when you refinance or you pay them off but there's some national brands and they're great companies but they sponsor 
baseball stadiums and NASCAR and college football games and dozens and dozens of other largely attended events. <laughs> now we're in 22 states, so we, 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 we're national too, but we don't sponsor a baseball park or a um, college football bowl game or NASCAR and, and all these other largely attended events. We're a mid-sized company and we're afforded some niche products. What does that mean? So products come out sometimes and there's only so many hundreds of millions or billions of dollars available for these niche products. And once we lock in rates for people, those products go away. So if the very, very big companies got a hold of these niche products, they have so many lenders nationwide, it would be gone like this. So we're a niche company. We get these niche products and the rates are lower um, or, or, or the programs are lower. Here's an example. Prior to last fall, if you bought a two, three or four unit building in Chicago and you moved into one of the units, you could get financing as a primary residence instead of secondary or investment, which are higher rates. But prior to the fall, if you bought a two, three or four flat, it would be 20% down. So we had a program way back last spring for only 5% down on a multifamily building. We had that way before everyone else got it. Now, Fannie has set aside, Fannie and Freddie has set aside so much funds you can, everyone can get that program now, but we had it maybe eight months before everyone else. That's not a rate a, a, a lower um, um, a scenario, but it's a program lower scenario, 5% versus 20%. So some, some mortgage companies get a niche products and can have a little bit of a better rate. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, we have a question about how do local policies in cities like Chicago affect the buying market? It obviously affects it. Um, I know in March we have on the voting ballot the uh, mansion tax. Uh, we won't get too far into that, but, you know, there is if that mansion tax passes, there's conversations of will that slow down luxury even more um, because there will be an additional tax at the closing table for those that are a million dollars and above. So policies like that could absolutely um, slow things down. I will say when things like that happen, it slows it down for the time being and then it adjusts because when buyers need to buy, they need to buy. When sellers need to sell, they need to sell. Um, but of course that does affect it. Um, we're being asked if Busby Group is doing any fun initiatives this year. Um, I, I, we always are doing fun initiatives. We're a fun team. Um, but I, really what we're passionate about at Busby Group is our give back. We are um, uh, very, uh, very proud to be a partner with um, Chicago Greater Food, Greater Chicago Food Depository, and every single transaction we give back to them. So a lot of initiatives this year are going to be around uh, pantry food drives for them, um, giving back to them. We're doing a lot around the city uh, to get back to the the food depository. So that's something we're really excited about. Um, and we're doing for, for people who refer to us, we're doing um, a chocolate of the month. Uh, there's all sorts of fun things. So you just need to sign up um, on our website and see what fun things we have in store. If I might add, attend one of their open houses. I'm <laughs> yes. to go to some of them. Last Sunday, uh, Susan and I had 50 people it was like a party on a cold Sunday <laughs> afternoon. Food, drinks, it was just really cool. 50 people from in a two-hour window. So just their open houses are fun in general. 
Well, and when we do an open house, a lot of times we bring incorporate local. So yes, we do have an international presence, but we like to be local. So we were, it's restaurant week in Chicago. So, which goes on for much longer than a week, but we like to highlight a local restaurant. And so we were doing giveaways for a local restaurant and they shared it. So we got a lot of great fun activity and Mike was there with food and treats. So it was fun. Um, okay. Uh, Marcy, we have a question for you. What are your favorite one or two easy hacks in preparing your home for the market or professional photos? Well, one of the hacks um, that actually can be utilized at any point is one thing that makes your house look dated and worn down are scuffs. Just wear and tear on your walls and on your trim. Amazon sells these small handheld paint touch up hmm. things. They're more than a pen, but less than, you know, a paintbrush. They've got a little roller on the end. You put your wall paint in there. It's got a cap. And when you see a scuff, you literally just take the cap off, fix your scuff and put it back on. You label them with your different paints, you know, you've got bathroom, bedroom, um, cabinet paint, if you have painted cabinets, sometimes those will get scuffed or scratched. Um, they're my favorite things. I tell every client when we paint their house, buy a set, have them already filled up and it keeps your house fresh. And that's hugely important when you're going to sell is, you know, making your walls look nice and clean. It kind of sets the tone for everything else. Um, and I know I was, you know, not pro heavy organization earlier, but um, putting clutter in cute baskets and getting calming the visual noise. And so, you know, if you have nine stuffed animals in your daughter's room, put them all in a basket and put the basket somewhere. And then you've only got one thing to look at versus nine. It makes the space feel more open. It makes it feel bigger and it makes it feel cleaner. And so, you know, go to... I love home goods. Home goods is always cheaper than Target. Um, and I go and I'll get a bunch and just go to town. Love it. That's what we say too. Baskets are your friend. Uh, but you've never shared that paint hack with me. So I oh my need gosh. to get the, I'm yeah. like, I need that immediately. That's amazing. We, I use them all the time. They're my favorite thing, especially for painted cabinets too, because it's like, once you start letting it go, it gets worse and worse and worse. But if you fix it, it won't, you know, it'll stop. Um, they're amazing. It's the best. That's awesome. Um, okay. We have a few more questions coming in, uh, which is great. Uh, how, how do you see the return to work and offices impacting the market? I think we're already seeing that just like I was saying, um, you know, Gold Coast has had a rough two years, but we're starting to see it. So I do think we're going to see um, still wanting to buy in downtown. And I think that's also kept Chicago, the city, cool, you know, and, and popular still because people are still wanting to. So we are going to see uh, an increase, slight increase in demand in Gold Coast, River North, et cetera. Okay. I think I've covered those. Let's see what else we've got. Mike. Yes. People are very interested in what we're up to. They want, they want to know if you have fun events at your office. <laughs> we do. Um, we have uh, two big buildings on Armitage and Elston. And one building is for the processing team and several lenders who have offices there. And then there's another building next door, which us guys call it a man cave. But since we're owned by a female, Nina Vlamis, it's called the She Shed. She has two bars, two pool tables, um, cooler uh, uh, refrigerators throughout the room, fully stocked. Um, there's a golf simulator so you can hit golf balls into a screen. There's a big screen TV. We do podcasts. We do videos. It is the coolest place, the She Shed. And we have events there, Cinco de Mayo, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Fourth of July. Um, reach out to me and I'll invite you. We'll, we'll have a good time at the She Shed. That's great. 
Well, since everybody has been talking about this, I am going to plug my project because yes. I think that it, so it's called Petite Acres. It's on four acres in New Buffalo, Michigan. So 90 minutes from the city. Um, it is going to be an event space. So you can do corporate retreats there. Um, so you could take Busby Group. You could take your team, Mike. Um, there's going to be an event barn. You There will be weddings available, but there are going to be nine tiny homes, two yurts for guided meditation, yoga. There will be art events there. There's going to be a main chateau, a main house. So if you are having um, a retreat, you can rent the house as well. And um, and then there's also going to be a freestanding gym and spa with like a cold plunge and sauna. Um, so if you look towards the end of 2025, beginning of 2026, corporate events um, will be able to be there as well. And that's what I will be busy doing for the next 24 to Very exciting. months. But yeah, well, a Busby yeah. Group corporate event would be fabulous there. Let's do it. And maybe next year we just are in two years when it's ready. We'll do this presentation from there. I, I love great. it. Yes. Uh, a, a few more questions coming in. Um, well, someone's giving you a thumbs up on on that. So, okay. Um, uh, a few questions coming in. Uh, when is the best time to sell if you're a seller and to buy if you're a buyer? So, um, seller, honestly, now, and here's why. Demand is starting to pick up. But inventory, remember, we're going to have an increase in inventory this year. We have not seen that yet. So we're already seeing demand um, pick up. Inventory is not there. So this is a great time. And spring market is when the buyers are the most active. It's usually between February to May is when the buyers are most active. So if you're one of the first ones on and, and the inventory is not picked up yet, this is an excellent time to sell. Um, Again, for buyers on buying, you know, Mike and I have already touched on it, but as we see more inventory, you will likely see a home that you like. And that is, this is a good year to buy because the rates are lower than last year. They're lower than the average. And you heard the data. If rates do change after an election, they do, you know, the, the history shows that they actually go up. So it would be smart to buy now. If they were to go down again, you could always, I know Mike has hooked people up with a cost-effective refi. You could always do that. But honestly, they're already still good. They're below what we've seen on average in the last 30 years. So as inventory is picking up, that is the time to be looking. And, and as rates are, are adjusting down from last year. Mike, do you have anything to add on that? No, but that's a good point you bring up about refinancing. Back when I was a landlord and I had several units in the city, if I could save $100 a month on my monthly payment, I was refinancing. That might not be cost effective. It might cost you several thousand dollars in closing costs to refinance. So you want to, you might want to wait till you get a larger um, savings on your monthly payment than just $100. So. Right. What I'm saying, well, what I'm saying is, and what Julie's saying is, so what? You're stuck at 5.5 or 6.25. It's not a bad rate. I mean, not. if it goes down to four or three, refinance. But I'm not going to call you and twist your arm and say, hey, the rates are down a half a point. I can save you $62. Why don't you refinance? Why? And spend right. thousands and thousands of dollars to save 68 bucks? No, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. That the rates are not that bad. But if they go down really low, close to where they were before, we'll refinance you. Well, but also, you know, economists, everyone's projecting rates to even get close to four or three. I mean, the best case is is high fives and or sixes, which we're already in the sixes. So, um, you know, again, it's better than last year. So it, it makes sense. Uh, looks like we've got some Marcy questions. Any trends on landscaping and outdoor areas? Um, yeah, I mean, and Julie, you and I have talked about this working on projects, um, but zoning out your space, making it work hard for you. You know, we all need in the city, especially, um, and specifically 
our backyards aren't huge and sometimes they're paved and you know we just we need to carve out different spaces if there's a cooking space if there's a dining space if there's a kids play space really maximizing that space um and another thing another trend that i've actually seen a lot happening especially in the bucktown area where there are lots of young families is container gardening and box gardening having raised garden beds because you can really put those anywhere you you only need as much soil as the you know 16 inch tall garden box and you're able to grow your own vegetables in the city and i think a lot of us tried and true city dwellers um really want to have that kind of suburban experience and everyone has just kind of figured out a way to do it they're doing it in large planters and in the container gardens great uh, mike what yes. about how do you get an offer accepted if it starts to get competitive out there so that's a great question too so before you do anything you need to get your personal finances in order. Um, get pre-qualified. Um, your income, your debt, your credit score, your cash for your down payment and closing costs. Um, if you do all this now, you'll be ready to beat the competition when you start looking for a home. And then I wrote down a few things that I wanted. This is perfect for this question too. These are the things you need to do once you do get your own financial house in order. You need to get pre-approved by a reliable mortgage lender. It does matter who you work with. I know someone asked earlier, what's the difference between their companies and the rates? The difference in the rates are minimal, but who you work with is huge. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you'll work with me. Um, you need to work with a professional, skilled, and experienced realtor. Who's better than Julie Busby and her team? Top 1%. I mean, they're all rock stars. Every one of them. I love working with them all. You got to act fast. Timing is uh, critical and it's everything. You need to make a competitive offer and your realtor can help you determine what that offer should be. You need to be flexible with your closing dates and your closing times. Use a real estate attorney, not a personal injury attorney, although he could do it. But Julie and I work with real estate attorneys and we know what we're doing. We're so comfortable with each other and we get things done on time and in full for a reasonable price instead of a client going through the yellow pages and picking an attorney uh, out of the air. You're not going to get a real estate professional and you're not going to pay the numbers Julie and I can get because we do so many deals. And then lastly, get an insurance agent you know and trust. And if you don't have an attorney or an insurance agent, Julie and I can help you with that because we, we only work with ones that are great and, and, and do our clients well. So those are the things you need to do to beat your competition. I agree. Be, be prepared and, and have knowledge on how to structure the contract. Um, someone asked if there's a book that we recommend to better understand uh, for a first time home buyer to invest in, in Chicago. Um, not necessarily it's a conversation with a, a broker who can help you navigate. Uh, when we meet with a new buyer, we usually do a, a first one-on-one -on -one conversation with them and we go over the process and what to expect and how to navigate it and how we look out for your best interests at heart um, to make sure it's a good financial investment for you. So uh, it, it's I will about- say, I will say this, I've worked with Julie and I, my first home and my second home, and I knew nothing, and it was an education that was wonderful, and we are in a home that we love, but I felt very well armed with all of the information and felt like I was going into the situation with eyes wide open because she and her team were just absolutely amazing at educating me where I had egregious ignorances when it came to the real estate market and investing in real estate. Here's, here's something cool in the work in the mortgage industry. You have to, you have to take a course or read a book called the first time homeowner home buyers toolkit. So that's pretty cool. Yes. I can, I can do the one-on-one -on -one with you Ju, with like Julie does with her clients and talk and explain everything. But the, the, the feds require you to get a little educated and, and, and read this booklet. So that's pretty cool. That is cool. 
Um, uh, people are asking, do we think it's going to get competitive with multiple offers? Are we starting to see that yet? Um, it depends on the home. It depends on the neighborhood, depends on the location, all, all, all the things. But yes, we've seen a few um, already pop up, not as many. Um, it's not as insane as it was two years ago or a year and a half ago, but um, we're seeing a few. Uh, suburbs, we see it more often than in the city, um, but in the city at certain price points, we are still having um, multiple offers. You don't normally have that in Q4, so we're coming out of a season where we didn't have a lot of that. Q4 just naturally is slower, uh, but we're going into spring market and we probably will have some multiple offers, especially if rates do come down more, uh, we will start to see the multiple offer action again. And uh, Mike's tips on being prepared are, are spot on to, to be ready for that. So uh, ironically, that, that is going on right now. For instance, I haven't seen it that much yet. Today, I have a client put, a, put an offer in on a home. The selling agent told the client's agent, there was nine offers. It was listed wow. at it was listed at four twenty five, and now they're up to four fifty. They're twenty five thousand above list price. Nine offers. That's the first time in a long time I've seen nine offers. Like Julie, and where said, where is it? Do you know? Is it somewhere over there? No, it's city. City. great. Yeah, good. Place. Nine offers today. Great. Well, I mean, I I know it's not great because that can be stressful as a buyer, but we can help you navigate that <laughs> and make it seamless. Uh, someone's asked North suburbs, um, Gray's Lake. Yes, um, North suburbs are, are, are popular. Again, they were, they were not for, for, for quite some time, but they are having their heyday and we in that are seeing great appreciation. Um, we just had a client, Jane and I, our, my director of ops, we were chatting earlier of someone who bought out in that area um, and in two years is already seeing a great appreciation. So there is is definitely, it's a good time to sell, um, to buy. I think we're still looking for more inventory, but again, we should see the inventory pick up this spring season. Okay, everyone, we've got two minutes left. Any more questions? Our favorite drink? <laughs> I feel like we've had some fun questions out there. I want to I want to plug your open house this weekend. Um, uh, uh, one of uh, uh, Julie's agents, Maggie Yandel, has an open house in Logan Square this Sunday from twelve to two at twenty eight fifteen North Willits. I will be there with Maggie. Yes. Hopefully, we'll have fifty people and have another party this Sunday. Twenty eight fifteen yes. North Willits. Thank you. And everyone go to our website. We have all of our listings. We have a, quite a few open houses this weekend and they're all beautiful homes. We have our choice to um, pick what listings we want to take. And we take ones that we are proud to um, to share with the public. So please look and see what we have open and visit Mike. He always brings some great treats for everyone. And again, we're doing some giveaways for restaurant week. Uh, one more minute. Any other questions? I think we've got it. The only one I was stumped on is the HOA and I will get that over to you. That is it. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in and for your great questions this year. Uh, kept us on our toes and that was fun. Uh, Marcy and Mike, it's always a pleasure working with you all. So thank you for tuning in. Um, and sorry if I seem a little dazed. Uh, little of it with my COVID. I'm hoping my COVID away soon, but uh, at least I'm getting it out of the way now. So spring market will, I'll be uh, back to the normal. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye.